Thank you for downloading or watching our podcast. The Apostle Paul cites a prophet Habakkuk in Romans 1 verse 17. Paul cites a prophet after giving the firm assurance that the gospel is the power of salvation. The gospel cultivates new life. The gospel bestows the promises of Christ. And the gospel is the only hope we can have in this age. So why does Paul use Habakkuk 2 verse 4 to prove this case that the just live by faith? Habakkuk is a minor prophet. And so what can he contribute to the scripture? How does Habakkuk exhort us, give us profound comfort, and even reorient our perspective in midst of a trying earthly sojourn? Well, we pick up where we left off last week with Habakkuk, where this is a man who surveys what he sees around him in Judah and that current situation, how it doesn't seem that things are right. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of idolatry and immorality going on. And Habakkuk wants to know what the Lord's going to do about this. He knows who God is. He brings his prayers to God. It does not seem as if they are heard or uh, listened to in any way. And so as Habakkuk continues to bring his prayers to God, finally the Lord comes and gives him an answer. And so now we find that there's this dialogue, this interaction between Habakkuk and the Lord, wanting to know what the Lord's plan is and if the Lord is really going to bring about uh, what Habakkuk desires. Again, remember, uh, one of the struggles we have as human beings is we want to harness God and make God do our will so that God does what we think is righteous and pure rather than understanding there's a bigger picture as to what the Lord is seeking to accomplish. And so when Habakkuk brings his request to the Lord, the Lord gave him a rather shocking revelation that Habakkuk would expect things to get better, but the Lord is saying, actually, it's going to get worse. I'm bringing this immoral nation to come and to bring judgment, and uh, Judah and Israel is going to fall, and you're going to see a lot of things happen that shock you, something that you would just not expect to happen. And so as Habakkuk hears this, and as we hear this, what does it ultimately mean as the Lord gives him this consolation in 2 verse 4, as Habakkuk asks these other questions about God and how he can work through this nation, the Lord gives him this exhortation in 2 verse 4 that the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Uh, some say it's by our faithfulness, that if we're faithful enough, God will bless us, and that adds to our blessing of justification in what we have in Christ, and it actually confirms it or actually fulfills the obligation of it. Others could say, well, it's just living by faith in the sense that we just know that we have Christ and then how we live is indifferent. So how, how do we reconcile this struggle that Habakkuk has what the Lord is saying, and then the Lord gives him this revelation that the just shall live by faith. And so as we consider this, we'll see first Habakkuk's shock, and secondly, the Lord's sustenance. So the shock of Habakkuk. Remember what Habakkuk has said in 1 verse 4, that the laws paralyze, the wicked surround the justice, Basically, justice and righteousness is perverted. So what is supposed to be right is declared wrong, and what is wrong is declared right. So the prophet wants to know, how can this be? Now in verse 12, he's affirming what the Lord has said. So he's not ignoring what God has said or dismissing what God has said, but he affirms who God is. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, the Holy One, or my Holy One? The reality is, he's affirming who God is. God is God. He is a righteous one. He is sovereign. And as God rules over all, Habakkuk understands, you are the righteous one. So Habakkuk's understanding what the Lord has said in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, through Moses. The Lord has made clear you forget my ways, you turn to other gods, I will bring in a nation to judge national Israel. You will be exiled from the land. So Habakkuk's saying, okay, 
I understand this is a nation you are using to bring about this judgment. Understood, loud and clear. Notice then how Habakkuk, in the midst of his turmoil or his crisis, affirms something significant. We shall not die. But Habakkuk is affirming who the Lord is. That he understands that while this judgment may transpire, and while they may be exiled from the land, and while they may engage in this war and this nation coming against them, where is his fundamental hope? His hope is knowing that the Lord has already promised, you will not die. So Habakkuk is understanding the chastisement of God, because the unfortunate thing, you know, as we mentioned in Jeremiah, where he cries out in chapter 5, where is the righteous one? Where is the righteous one? Here we have one that says, I am a righteous one. I desire the ways of the Lord. But Habakkuk's affirming the reality that while the Lord does chastise his people, and as the Lord uh, can bring his discipline, as Hebrews 12, 6 tells us, that he disciplines his children, he can do this in his providence, he can do this through the means he desires. Habakkuk's understanding, okay, so for them, they're being taken out of the land. The ones that don't love the Lord, they will be dealt with. However, the righteous ones, okay, we're also going to receive a chastisement and we will not die. And so he's affirming the fundamental promise of God that no matter what he sees, he will not truly taste death. And again, what does death mean? Death is being estranged, cut off from the blessings of God. Habakkuk is saying, you will be faithful to your promise, I affirm this, and we will not die. And so as the Lord has ordained them as judgment, as reproof, he's saying, fine, I make this concession. This is your means, this is what you desire, and I'm willing to accept it. <clears throat> but now he wants to understand something more. <clears throat> he wants to understand how the Lord can use something that's worse to come against his people. I mean, his people have done some pretty grotesque things, as you read the, the recollection in 2 Kings. But as his people have in, in, engaged in immorality and all sorts of things, he's saying, but what about this nation? This nation isn't exactly something we'd say is wonderful or something pure or something that's worthy to administer your justice. And so now Habakkuk is addressing who these people are. He's pointing out who these individuals are. That as the Lord has said, you will not believe. He's saying, okay, you're the one who understands. You're the one who cannot look at wrong. You're the one who judges rightly. But you understand who these men are. These are wicked individuals. They swallow up the righteous. And so again, Habakkuk wants to know. Why are you sitting idly by allowing this nation to prosper and to prosper on your people and it just seems you're just allowing this to happen. You're, you're helpless. You're just letting them go and do what they want. Notice in verse 14 how he talks about the creation order being flipped completely upside down. He uses this language of mankind being like the fish in the sea. So he's using a metaphor. Uh, so you think of man as being fish in the sea, you have these fishermen who basically go through without any regard for the fish. Uh, they don't think about tomorrow. They just greedily think, let's catch as many fish as we can today without comprehending that maybe tomorrow, if we catch all the fish, we'll have nothing left. In other words, man is not desiring to be a steward in any way. Man just desires to, to give in to his own desires. And how did the Lord create man? Remember in Genesis 1 verse 26, the Lord says these words. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 1 26. You have then that reminder that man in Genesis 1 verse 28 as he takes dominion of this creation, he is to be like a ruler, like a king. And so yes, he can use a creation to his benefit and its resources, but he's not to use them greedily. 
Because you notice how man is still to rule under the authority of God. God is God, man is a king underneath God. And so what, what is the absurdity of what these men are doing? Well, they're going around, they're dragging the fish up, and they're not saying, thank you, God, for giving me a good catch today. Thank you, God, for your provision. Uh, thank you, God, for what you have done. But they're offering a sacrifice to his net. In other words, he's trusting in his net. He's trusting in his wealth. He's made this an idol. And so Habakkuk is saying, Lord, this is what these men have done. They're supposed to see themselves as under your authority. They, they have no regard for you. They greedily go into nations like locusts or like the greedy fishermen that catch everything. And then they, they give thanks to the means of war, to what their God may be, and not to the God of heaven. Because notice the exploitation. He keeps emptying his net, mercilessly, mercilessly killing nations forever which is driving home the point. It's not Habakkuk saying the fishing industry is a problem or something like that. It's Habakkuk saying, here's the problem with these men. They go into the nations, they take everything, they exploit everything. They're like locusts. They're like these greedy men who give no understanding or comprehension or submission to the true God of heaven. So he's saying to God, this is how you've created the world. There's supposed to be justice, there's supposed to be some form of righteousness, and yet we see it's all flipped upside down. So Habakkuk doesn't know what to do with this. So in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, okay, these are my concerns. You're answering me, I know who you are, you can use this nation to bring justice, I can see that, but why this nation? And he says, I'm going to take my stand in my watch post. Now, some people take this as a literal stand in the sense of a tower that he's going to stand on the wall and, and stand guard, which is possible. I take it more uh, metaphorically that he's going to take a stand in the temple. He's going to wait quietly upon the Lord. He's going to stay silent. And he's going to watch. He's going to wait for the Lord to give an answer which is something that we find in terms of our prayers and how we bring our prayers before our God, is teaching us something about our human condition. We don't naturally want to do this. And Calvin, I appreciate his comment on this verse, where Calvin says, For though one may be resolved to hear God, we yet find that many temptations immediately distract us. It is not then enough to become teachable, and to apply our ears to hear his voice, except also our eyes be connected with him, so we may be altogether attentive. It's important to understand that as Habakkuk is taking his watch, he's fixing his eyes on the Lord. It's important to understand, uh, and to understand this when you look at Habakkuk 2 verse 4 and to understand how this fits together in what the Lord is saying in terms of the just shall live by faith. And so here's Habakkuk then. He brought his complaint to God. He brings the difficult questions to God in prayer, which teaches us something, that our God is rather thick-skinned. He wants us to bring our concerns to him. He wants us to bring our frustrations to him. And yet we are reminded that when we bring these frustrations, we wait for the Lord to answer in the Lord's time according to his wisdom and according to his plan. And so now we find that as Habakkuk waits, the Lord answers. And the Lord answers him and tells him to do something. He tells him to write this on tablets. Now it's not specific. This could actually be wood plaques. Uh, it could be bronze. It could be stone. Whatever the case the revelation that the Lord brings to the prophet is to go beyond the prophet, which means today we hear this. And the intention is that we would hear this same message as we may have these very same questions. And so as he is to write this on the tablets, the Lord saying, listen, Habakkuk, you're not unique in bringing these concerns to me. This is what mankind's going to ask throughout the generations. And so I want you to write this on something tangible. And the implication now is that as he writes it on something tangible, that the individual who is beaten down, so he may be 
placing this in Jerusalem. He may be placing this in Babylon. He may have made two copies of this for all we know, one in Jerusalem and one for Babylon. We don't know. Whatever the case, the implication is that as someone would read this, that as they're downcast, you know, you you read of the Apostle Paul speaking of the messenger who runs, and you can tell if he has good news or bad news. If he has bad news, he's kind of slumped over because he doesn't want to deliver the bad news because the king may be angry and may actually execute the messenger. Hence the saying, don't kill the messenger. If he has good news, he runs quickly because he's excited. He's going to receive praise and the king's going to be happy with him. That's the implication here. That somebody is walking past us, thinking of their fate, having the same weight as Habakkuk, wondering about the goodness of God, and then boom, they see this message. They see this plaque. And all of a sudden their, their whole countenance picks up and their step picks up in speed and they understand the Lord's still sovereign and their eyes are cast upon their God. And so again, I don't think that it's just chapter 2, verse 2, continuing on, but it's the Lord telling Habakkuk to write this whole interaction between the prophet and God. And so this is where, even today, we read this. As I've mentioned before, we can read the news, we can look at our current events, and we can wonder, where is God in the midst of it? We read Habakkuk, and we can be assured that God is very much in the midst of it all. So the Lord then tells him something about the timing. And the timing that he tells us is that there's this vision, it hastens to the end, uh, it will not lie, if it seems slow, wait for it. And so as he says these things, one uh, key word to point out here is hastens to the end. I believe some may say it's testimonious to the end or something along those lines. Uh, the translation of this is actually like the breathes or, or the breathing of God. And so you think about the Apostle Paul speaking of uh, the marathon runner and how our Christian life, we continue to keep our, our eyes to the goal. We understand it's a long race and, and we want to get ourselves mentally prepared for the long race. That there's the ups, the downs, the challenges, the hills, the valleys, and we want to finish and cross that line uh, in Christ and for his glory. Now the flip side of this in terms of this uh, paradigm or this parable or uh, metaphor, whatever you want to call it, is that as the Lord breathes, it's the assurance that the Lord is accomplishing his goal. And so it's presented as if God sees history as that marathon. God stands out of history, but God also works in history. And so God is driving this history to its goal, to its end. Now we as humans are expecting the sprint. You know, that's what Habakkuk wants. I see this, I want this, my way is right, do my will, O God. And the Lord is saying, Habakkuk, there's a whole picture here. And I understand the long trajectory of history. I'm in control of it. I'm leading it to its end. Now, generations may come along and say, well, where is the promise of this God? Isn't this what Peter's dealing with in 2 Peter of the scoffer saying, where is the promise of his coming? History has always been, right? And Peter says, well, actually, it hasn't. There's been interruptions in history, and the Lord has shown again and again that his judgment is coming. That's the same thing here. And so we have to understand that the Lord is saying, my judgment, my will, my kingdom, my glory is being established. It may not be at the pace that man wants it to be established. It is being established. And so now we say, okay, so we understand the Lord's vision, the Lord's goal in history is being established. We understand the prophet's going to wait upon the Lord. We understand these things. The Lord wants these things written on plain tablets. So now we turn to verse 4. As I mentioned, uh, a way to translate this is that the righteous shall live by his faithfulness. It's a valid translation. Uh, what does that faithfulness mean? It could be the faithfulness of God. It could be my faithfulness, completing the work of God. Or it could be something else. And obviously I'm going with the something else translation. But in terms of what this means, what is the contrast? I think that's an important question to ask. Because in verse 4, he's or the Lord is giving Habakkuk a contrast. 
a contrast between the arrogant and a contrast between the righteous. So the arrogant is the one who is puffed up. Uh, this is the one that rests on self, the one that gives the offering to the net, the one that trusts in the, in the military might, unlike the Babylonians. You know, even God himself says, hey, their, their God is their might, their God is their weaponry, their, their God is their victory. That's what they live for. And Habakkuk has understood, yes, a consumed man like a greedy fisherman consumes the fish of the sea rather than thanking God or asking God for wisdom, what does a fisherman do? Well, he sets up his idols to the net. And so, in other words, he trusts in his victory. He trusts in what is tangible, what is beneficial for him. It's important to understand that. Trusting in what is beneficial for the individual immediately. That's the arrogant. That's the one who is not resting in the Lord. So what about the righteous then? What, what does that mean? Well, we find righteousness contrasted in Habakkuk. We have in 1 verse 4, the wicked surround the righteous. The righteous are those who have their tenderness to the Lord, to his justice, to what is right, and desire to take the Lord's wisdom and, and live it out. 1 verse 13, the righteous are those who are conquered by the wicked. Uh, someone like Habakkuk, praying out to God, asking, well, what is my fate? How do I order this? 1 verse 13, or going on then in 2 verse 4 here, where we have the righteous contrasted with the arrogant. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that these are obviously the ones who have an orientation to the Lord. Now we can say, that, okay, so the translation is, they're faithful to the Lord, therefore they don't deserve this fate. Well, Habakkuk has already conceded, fine, if I need to be chastised and corrected by the Lord, so be it. Chastise me, I will not die. I will endure by the grace of God. The thing to understand in the context of this is to understand the history in Genesis 15, verse 6. When Abram says amen to the promises of God, which is actually what it means. Uh, the Lord gives him a promise. The Lord is the one who's going to take death in the place of Abraham, so Abraham can have life. And what does Abram say? Amen. I believe this. I will struggle to live my life in light of this promise. And you think about Abram, and you think about how Abram lived this out. We have in Genesis 16, he has an adulterous affair. And that's not just a problem of adultery. That's just scraping the surface. The real problem in Genesis 16 is that he doubts the Lord can bring about his redemptive promise. He doubts that the Lord can bring a son or life from death. And so this is deeper than just some human weak desire in the moment. You have in Genesis 12, 13, and 20 where Abram lies about Sarah being his wife. And she is then brought into the king's harem, and she is endangered. But then you also have the commentary in Hebrews 11, verse 10, where Abram is listed as one who's a hero of faith. And why? Because Hebrews 11, verse 10, gives us an insight as to the perspective of those who are the righteous. Those who order and orient their lives in light of who they are in Christ. What is Abram's ultimate trajectory? He's continuing to put his focus on the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly glory. That's where he sojourns. What's Habakkuk doing here? Asking God, this is what I perceive. It doesn't seem right. I'm challenging you on this, but I'm still waiting for my answer. And then we think about other things in Abram's life. He's the one who does ultimately walk up into the mountain to sacrifice Isaac. Why? Because he realizes the promise of God is bigger than this child. He understands this child could very much be an idolatrous distraction, keeping him from seeing the purpose and, and, and vision of God. And so the Lord says, sacrifice the child. He knows the Lord can raise his child, and so he follows through in the confidence of the Lord's promise. You have also Abram, or Abraham, who sends 
uh, Hagar and Ishmael out of his house. A difficult thing for him to do. You read of Abraham's turmoil, but he understands this is the right thing to do for the honor and glory of his God. And so what is Habakkuk teaching us? Well, he's not teaching us that the just live by faithfulness in the sense that our works add to our justification. In the sense that we're declared righteous, but then we need to live faithful enough so that we really are righteous, or really on the day of judgment, we've merited heaven. That's not what the Lord is saying. When he's speaking of faithfulness, well, what does that faithfulness mean? Well, it's a fruit of our faith. It means our lives are going to ebb and flow. There's going to be times like we see with Abraham, where there's low points where he's doubting the promises of God. But the overall trajectory, well, what is the call of Abraham? To keep his eyes focused on the giver of life. To rest in the promises of God. To know that the promises of God are yes and amen and certain. And then the fruits of his faith manifest themselves, or his faithfulness, if that's what we want to say. But they're not adding to the tangible blessing he has in Christ, the one-time declaration of righteousness. It's really the fruits of his faith, the orientation of his life. So what is the Lord then saying to Habakkuk? Well, he's drawn the contrast between the proud or the arrogant and the faithful. The arrogant is the one that says, let's seize a day. The arrogant is the one that gives the blessing to the net. The arrogant is the one that doesn't wait on the promises of God. Habakkuk is the one that says, okay, chastisement is coming. I don't really like that answer, but yet I know I will not die. I will persevere through this. In other words, Habakkuk is waiting on the promises of God. It's not to say it's always easy to do this, but the Lord is saying that's where life is found. Life is found in the promises of God. Because where does Abram say amen? He says amen to the Lord who has walked between the pieces of animals, and the Lord saying, I will take the sanction of hell, the pain of hell, in your place so you have life. And so the Lord is saying to Habakkuk, listen, Habakkuk, my wisdom is not always going to make sense to man. How I orchestrate history is not always going to make sense to man. But you need to believe this. I am still sovereign. My redemption is still sure. And I am still carrying out my purposes. If you want to ask, well then, how do I know if I'm one of the righteous ones? Do you live in that? Is that your comfort? Is that where you struggle? Is that your hope? That your Lord is the one who will persevere or preserve you to the end? If that's your hope, then this promise is yours. If you're saying, well, this is ridiculous because the Lord's never going to accomplish his redemptive purpose, he's never going to bring about his redemption, well, then you're in a dangerous place. We may struggle with this, but yet the call is for us to continually find our hope and our assurance in the promises of God. We start with those promises, and then we live our life in light of it, even as we struggle to be oriented to the goal of heaven, finding our redemption, finding our life, finding our peace in the midst of our God. And so when the Lord says this to Habakkuk, he's saying, listen, Habakkuk, rest in me. My promises may seem long and drawn out. You may not like the timetable, but move to a run. Pick up your countenance. I am carrying out my purpose, even as it may not seem, seem like it. Believe it. Find your confidence in it. Say amen to these promises, not amen to your faithfulness, not amen to your power, but say amen to my faithfulness and who I am as your God. And so when we begin then, and we hear this call for us to do the will of God and to live by faith and what it means to be the faith of the faithful, it's a call for us then to bring our requests our burdens, our struggles to the Lord. Why is Habakkuk struggling? Because he believes that his God can deal with the struggle. He doesn't turn to another God. He turns to his God and he says, these are the promises I believe. This is what I understand from your word. This is what I see. Lord, help me. 
And the Lord's answer is, Habakkuk, you're kind of right, but you're not seeing the big picture. Continue to trust in me, and that is life. The call then is for us as God's people is to live out of this faith and to desire the fruits of this faith but not to rest in our faith in and of ourselves in the sense of my fruits or my faithfulness or my power, but is resting in the promises of God, understanding that my faith is taking hold of something far bigger and more powerful than myself. It's taking hold of the resurrected Christ. This is the ultimate peace we have. The Lord is then exhorting us to live as Abraham, with that trajectory of our eyes, our goal of understanding. We are not people that find this world as our ultimate resting place and home. We are people who find our resting place in the city whose builder and founder is God, whose architect is God, is the one who has built his heavenly glory. The call then for us is to see that the Lord's redemptive promises have come to fruition. Christ was raised up in the line of Judah. Israel was delivered from their exile. Christ was raised from the dead. Peter himself echoes this same thing that the Lord told Habakkuk to write. It may seem that the Lord is slow in delivering his promises, but it's on the timetable of God. Let us then wait upon the Lord. Let us say amen to the promises of the gospel. And let us struggle to live our lives in light of them, desiring to conform to our Lord, living out of gratitude, living as living sacrifices unto him. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, Please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, URCBEL g-r-a-d-e dot com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.